This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him. I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell. <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world. Is that right? <laughs> Everyone has no doubt used Band-Aids or Tylenol. Those products are well-known products produced by Johnson & Johnson. But Johnson & Johnson is also a giant in many other areas. It's now taking a leading role in preparing a vaccine for COVID-19. Its CEO is Alex Gorski, a West Point trained former military man who has done an incredible job over the last eight years making this company the most valuable healthcare company in the world. Now, some people say the most commonly spoken words in the English language today are, can you hear me, because of uh, the Zoom phenomenon. But I assume in your case, the most commonly asked question of you is, when is the vaccine coming? So you must get asked this about every hour on the hour. So why don't I just do this as well? When is your vaccine coming? Well, look, it's usually about every 15 minutes, actually, that, that I get asked okay. that. And, uh, and let me start by saying I could not be more proud of the incredible work uh, that our scientists and our engineers have been doing over the past nine months to, to put us into the position that we are today with a vaccine. I mean, to think that you know, what would ordinarily take five or seven years we've been able to do in you know, a matter of months is quite remarkable. And uh, you know, without uh, the hard, their hard work and dedication, you know, probably 40,000 of our 150,000 employees uh, mostly in our factories and uh, facilities and our laboratories have still been working. And, um, and they've been going literally around the clock to make that possible. And look, we still have a lot of work to do, but we made a lot of progress and, uh, and we'll be finding out a lot more in the coming weeks and months. But, you know, consistent with what we talked about just recently when we announced the start of our phase three trial, we would expect by late this year, early next year, we should be in a position uh, to begin reviews with regulatory authorities to see if our vaccine uh, is in fact safe, effective, and, and something that uh, could be uh, considered for an emergency use, use authorization here in the United States and, and more likely around the world. So even if you have emergency use authorization, to be realistic about it, it's not going to be ready until next year. Is that right? I think, I think that's a good time frame to be planning on. Uh, you know, in, uh, and again, a lot of it's going to depend on what we find in phase three. And, you know, David, as you know, that can depend on the incidence of the virus, of course, because that has an impact on the statistical analysis that you'll be using in your study. It's going to depend on how well our vaccine is actually doing in the study and what kind of efficacy rates we hit. But I think for planning purposes, if you think about late uh, 2020 and early 2021, uh, I think those are the kind of timelines that are likely most realistic. Okay. Now, there, you and a number of other CEOs of vaccine manufacturers have issued a letter saying basically you don't want to be politically pressured to have a certain uh, date and so forth. And can you articulate why you felt the need for that letter? Well, look, we think this is an incredibly important time for the pharmaceutical industry, let alone each of our companies. And it's absolutely critical during a time when unfortunately everything becomes politicized that we rely on data, that we rely on science, that we rely on well-established regulatory guidelines to guide all of our decisions regarding the de development and the actual utilization of these vaccines. And we thought that uh, collectively uh, making a very explicit statement about our commitment, our pledge to following those established guidelines was very important to, to maintain the trust, to maintain the confidence of people around the world regarding the safety and efficacy and, and actual accessibility of these vaccines. In a recent survey, I read that, uh, that was done of Americans that only 19% are yet prepared today to take a vaccine if it's available. Is that a surprise to you that so many people are not yet ready to take it? Is that because of the perceived politicization of it? Well, David, unfortunately, no, it's not a surprise. And it's, it's actually fairly consistent 
in fact, with what you see with the annual flu vaccine that can range from anywhere from about 20% and perhaps in some of the best states as high as 40, 40 or 50%. And, and like, I understand some of the skepticism and cynicism. There's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of concern about that people genuinely have, uh, you know, based upon some of the readings that you can find out there. But I think that demonstrates is just how important it is for us to, number one, to work closely with healthcare authorities, whether it's the CDC, BARDA, the NIH, the FDA, agencies outside the United States to follow those appropriate protocols. I think secondly, it's gonna take a lot of education. Uh, and, and that's by the way, not only the responsibility, I believe of the pharmaceutical industry, but it's gonna require the government, it's going to require perhaps even businesses, other stakeholders to make sure that we are sharing the facts. Look, I'm cautiously optimistic that as we provide more data, more information, uh, that as you know, people see the the potential impact, positive impact that this could have in terms of returning back to a more normal state uh, in some way, uh, that uh, you know, people will you know, find uh, the, the comfort and confidence uh, to have a vaccine uh, because ultimately that it's going to be very important as we think about you know, returning to a new kind of normal. Now the federal government has poured billions of dollars into uh, getting the vaccine developed and provided you and other companies with that money to help you facilitate uh, the production of this. Uh, do you think that the taxpayers should get a benefit by either getting very low cost vaccines or free vaccines? Well, yes, David, look, I, I think it's in the public's best interest that we're seeing this kind of public private partnership. I mean, there, it would be very difficult uh, for us to make the kind of advancements and accelerate the timelines that we're doing right now, were it not for the partnership that we're seeing not only in terms of funds being provided, but in terms of literally the day-to-day -day interactions that are taking place between regulators and scientists across many of these platforms. You know, in our case, from the very beginning, we made a pledge that we would do this on a not-for-profit basis. And uh, yes, we are working with the government and we've accepted government funds, uh, but we also recognize that as Johnson & Johnson, the world's largest healthcare company, that's important for us uh, at this very unique time uh, to do it on a not-for-profit basis so that we can give as many people access around the world as possible. Uh, so that's the approach that we're taking. Now, there's a fear in some circles that wealthy people will get the vaccine quicker than people that are not wealthy. And you have, with other CEOs and other healthcare officials and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, signed a letter essentially saying you're committed to making certain that it doesn't go only to wealthy people and only to people in the United States. Can you explain why you wanted to have that letter and how you're going to make sure that happens? Well, look, we're the only way we're going to beat this virus is if we have global distribution and no one is safe, frankly, if the entire world is not provided access. And so we are absolutely committed to doing this in a very ethical, in a very just way. Uh, and, uh, and we've worked very hard to make agreements, clearly with governments like the United States and Europe, Japan, the developed countries, but we're also working hand in hand with other pharmaceutical companies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to ensure that developing countries also have got access. Looking back, what would you say that the CDC or the FDA or the White House or HHS should have done differently? Almost all of us have underestimated the dramatic impact of this outbreak. So as we talk today, uh, the big news is that President Trump and the First Lady have contracted uh, the coronavirus. Uh, is that a surprise to you that that could possibly happen? Well, David, look, I think it demonstrates that we're all vulnerable and we still all need to be very vigilant and diligent in the actions that we're taking to prevent this virus from spreading any further. So you, as the CEO of the largest healthcare company in the United States, I think it's the 10th largest company by market cap in the entire United States, market value of about almost $400 billion. You have to be very careful because I think it would look bad, wouldn't it, if the CEO of the largest healthcare company got the virus. So what do you do to uh, protect yourself? Well, David, look, uh, I think all of us have a huge responsibility to take care of ourselves and 
certainly those of us like myself fortunate to be in this kind of a position where we have responsibility for others have got to make sure that we put the safety of our employees, of our friends, of our families first in everything that we do. And uh, look, that starts with the simple things. And I think one of the things that we've learned most through this pandemic is by making sure that we're using social distancing, that we're wearing masks, that we're washing our hands, that we're doing everything we can to prevent the spread of the virus are the most important steps that we can take uh, to actually bringing an end to this pandemic and, uh, and dealing with it for the long term. Now, vaccines are what everybody has been focused on, but there's also therapeutics. So for people who might have already contracted the uh, disease or already have the virus, uh, is there any progress being made on therapeutics that might help people that already have the, uh, the, the disease? Well, David, that's, that's a great point. There is no one silver bullet here. And I think what is really important for everyone to understand, it's gonna take a holistic approach because likely we're gonna be dealing with this not only as a pandemic, but it's going to be endemic for several years going forward. So in all likelihood, it's gonna take a combination of therapeutics for patients who are actually sick, vaccines to present it, prevent it from happening in the first place. And you know, last but not least, the hospital protocols that I think have done a great job, still much more work to do in terms of reducing actual mortality and morbidity. So things that have been talked about are remdesivir, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and also, um, convalescent plasma. But generally today, you wouldn't say that those things are therapeutics that are going to solve the problem. Is that right? Not e each and of themselves. I think there will be various opportunities you use them. And look, we're going to learn, for example, with convalescent plasma, when and where are they most in, uh, effective? In what patient population? Is it an older population? Could they be used, for example, in an elder care facility where you're seeing an outbreak in a more aggressive way? Uh, should antivirals be used earlier in the disease? And I think we're, again, we're developing a lot of information as we speak, and we're going to learn a lot more in the coming weeks and months. Hindsight is always 2020, it is said. But looking back, what would you say that the CDC or the FDA or the White House or HHS should have done differently? Is there anything that you would recommend to somebody in the future that they do differently if they were overseeing this kind of pandemic response? Well, you know, you're right. When we look backwards, th things always seem clear. And, uh, you know, I think there's a few lessons. And, and I would also say that almost all of us have underestimated the dramatic impact of this outbreak. I mean, if you would have asked most people eight or nine months ago, if you would ever see the kind of impact that we're, you know, seeing around the world right now, few would have gotten it right. Uh, but I think there are lessons to be learned. First and foremost, I think is the importance, David, of global public health. And I think going forward, we're going to understand much better that, you know, if we don't have global public health security, we don't have national security, we don't have economic security, and we will not have security as society. So I think the importance of being prepared, making sure that, you know, we've got the kind of protocols in place, that we have certain products prepositioned, and frankly, also move from a maniacal focus on efficiency and effectiveness in certain cases to one more of resiliency and sustainability, particularly for these kind of situations. Were even you surprised how dependent uh, maybe Johnson & Johnson and the healthcare industry was on manufacturing things in China and offshore so that for PPE and other things, we really had to almost beg uh, the Chinese to get us some material. Uh, will that change in the future? And were you surprised at the extent that we were so dependent on offshore production? Well, yes. And I look, I think this is an important lesson for all industries, not only the healthcare industry, but, you know, every supply chain. And the good news is over the last several decades, the globally integrated supply chain has reaped tremendous rewards. And again, in terms of efficiency and effectiveness for so many different companies. However, I think it's important for us to realize that we've got to make sure that we've got the kind of redundancy and resiliency when these types of situations arise. And uh, so we're, we're looking hard across our supply chain as we speak to say, look, what are the things where, we, yes, we can still take advantage of so many of the efficiencies from what we were doing before, but what other things do we need to think about reshoring? Uh, what other capabilities do we need to think to have more local uh, to ensure that you know, in future pandemics, we're all better positioned and better prepared.
If the doctor says uh, you need a Band-Aid here, I'll give you a shot, and he puts a Band-Aid on that's not a Band-Aid, it's some other company's product, you take it off? Well, I actually had that happen one time. I had a uh, bicycling accident where I had to get some stitches in my hand, and of course, when I went to the local hospital, I made sure that they were our sutures. Let's talk about how you went from a graduate of the West Point to becoming the CEO of this company. So where did you grow up? Well, uh, David, I couldn't have imagined you know, 20, 40, 60 years ago that I'd ever be in this role or position. But I, I was actually born in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, my grandparents, uh, for the most part, were immigrants uh, and opened up uh, small stores, worked in uh, meatpacking uh, plants uh, in Kansas City. And uh, I was there through my early years, and then my father was moved with his job when I was about 12 years old uh, to a little town in the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. What propelled you to say, I want to go to West Point? Well, look, I was, I was very fortunate, and you know, both my mother and father worked. My, my father uh, started as a salesman in a, in a foods company, Gerber Baby Food, and, and kind of worked his way up the ladder. But he was also a Korean War veteran, and, uh, and he stayed in the Army Reserves, uh, and my mother uh, taught uh, special education students. And so I thought it was natural when you were growing up that your father not only went to work and your mother went to work, but also that, you know, one weekend a month that he would put a uniform on to go serve his country. And, um, and I was really inspired by that. Uh, and, and I was one of six children. Uh, and, uh, and I also knew that uh, going to a place like West Point not only would afford me an opportunity for a great education and a career, uh, but it was also a, certainly an economical way to do it, and you know, one where I could pay my own way through. And, and so I put all that together, and, and I found that to be a, a really you know, attractive path, and, uh, and I was fortunate that I, that's what I was able to follow. And when you graduated, did you say, now I want to be a healthcare executive, or how long did you stay in the military? No, no. I, uh, look, I graduated, and like all of my classmates, I, I went into the Army as a lieutenant, uh, I, had a, uh, I had an assignment in Europe for my very first uh, role, and then I was stationed back in the United States, actually out of Fort Ord, California in the 7th Infantry Division. And I spent six years uh, where I uh, ended my service as a, as a captain. I was a battery commander in a rapid deployment force unit, and uh, that's when I made my decision to uh, you know, exit the Army and join Johnson & Johnson. Now, you also got an MBA from Wharton. Yes. When did you have time to do that? Well, you know, I... I started, uh, when I left the Army, I started as a sales representative at Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it was part of a leadership development program, and I, but I felt getting the skills, understanding the customers, really learning you know, what doctors and surgeons and nurses and people who are using our products on a day-to-day -day basis, that was an important experience to get. Uh, and, um, and, and then I went into sales management, later into marketing, but I also realized that, look, I had, I had studied engineering in college. Uh, and, um, and I realized that if I was going to have the skills in business that I felt were really necessary, uh, that, you know, going back and getting exposed in much more depth to accounting, to finance, to strategy and other things was going to be important. And I was, uh, I was very fortunate that they supported my attendance at the, uh, executive MBA program at Wharton, uh, where I went and completed that, uh, you know, at an early point in my career. So you started out marketing with a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. Um, yeah. At the time that you did that, did you say, well, somebody who starts out as a marketing person for this subsidiary surely should rise up to be the CEO someday. Um, did you ever imagine at that point that you could rise up or you, you always had that as your goal? No, you know, I, I, I did realize, however, that getting exposure and experience with as many different aspects of our business early on in my career was important. And, and marketing was one place where you could interface with research and development to really understand our products, where you would, inter where you would engage with your finance counterparts, your supply chain people. And so it was really a, the kind of position that exposed you to almost all aspects of the organization. And look, at that time, I aspired to perhaps uh, be able to run one of our, uh, our divisions and, um, and, and, and from there, uh, things took on a life of their own. So you've now been the CEO uh, since uh, 2012, so about uh, eight years or so. And for most CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, unless they were the founder of them, generally five, six years is fairly average. So you're eight. Um, 
uh, but you're very young and you're obviously in good shape. So is your plan to do this for a long time in the future? Well, look, David, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to be the seventh CEO of Johnson & Johnson. You're right. The, I think one of the, uh, the great characteristics of the company is the uh, long tenure that my predecessors have had in the, in the continuity, the consistency, and the kind of long range thinking that it imbued into the organization. And, uh, and I'm proud to you know, have been part of that. And, uh, and, and look, I'm, I'm as excited today about what I'm seeing in terms of science and technology and the potential for the patients. I mean, look what we're doing with the vaccine. We couldn't have even imagined that you know, with about 10 months ago. And uh, so that it, it's, you know, it, it's a constant stream of new opportunities, challenges that you're facing along the way. Uh, but look, you know, like everybody, um, I, I would always consider ways of how could you continue to serve other stakeholders? How could you continue to serve others? But uh, you know what, I, I think I've got the best job in the world most days. Now you are a fitness uh, expert or a, a person who cares a lot about fitness. You're always running, you're exercising. And so I assume during this period of time, you're doing it even more just to stay in shape. Is that right? Do you run uh, a lot or do you exercise a lot every day? Yes, I do, David. And and look, I learned a long time ago, uh, even during my time in the military, that one of the most important things you can do uh, to ensure that if, if by chance you know you were, you were wounded was to be healthy in the first place. And it's interesting because I think one of the things that we're learning about this disease, of course, is that the healthier you are, if you in fact should contact the disease, likely the better prepared you're going to be to be able to survive and get through it in a much better manner. And, uh, you know, look, like many others, uh, I've been doing my best to, to deal with this situation, not only working out of the house, but taking care of myself. But yes, I, I always put a priority on, uh, you know, trying to take care of ourselves, stay healthy, get the kind of rest that you need, eat the right way. And um, I think doing all these things not only happen or help in your daily life, but certainly are going to affect in a situation like COVID-19 as well. So when you're running the biggest healthcare company in the United States, I guess you're always worried that somebody might see you eating a French fry or a Big Mac or, you know, you're, you gained an extra pound or something. Do you feel you got to be very careful because everybody's watching you of who you are and the company you're running? No, no, I don't worry about that. Look, I think I think what's important about life and so many things is balance. And uh, and I tend to follow an axiom that, look, during the week, especially given my travel schedule and the demands, is I tend to be pretty strict, uh, you know, about what I eat and, and the kind of rituals that I put in place. It just keeps me on pace, whether I'm here in New Brunswick or whether I'm in China or traveling in other places around the world. But hey, on the weekend, of course, I, uh, I, like, to, uh, I like to have a burger from time to time or, or that steak. And uh, that's why I work so hard uh, in trying to keep fit along the way. And, and I find by having that balance, hey, I, I, can, uh, I can take care of myself, but I can also have fun. So um, you're in pretty good shape, uh, obviously. So, but you eventually, I guess you have, uh, you go to the doctor for annual physicals or something like that. If the doctor says, uh, you need a Band-Aid here, I'll give you a shot. And he puts a Band-Aid on that's not a Band-Aid, it's some other company's product. Do you take it off or do you say, you can only use Johnson & Johnson products on me? Well, I actually had that happen one time. I had a uh, bicycling accident where I had to get some stitches in my hand. And of course, when I went to the local hospital, I made sure that they were our sutures. Uh, so, uh, and look, I've, uh, I've had my hip replaced. Uh, I have one of our products, uh, in my hip and, uh, it, it feels great. And, uh, it was, it was a life changer for me once I had that procedure done. Well, listen, uh, I appreciate you giving us this much time. I hope the vaccine comes as soon as possible and a healthy and uh, good way and safe for everybody. You can rest assured that we're going to be working 24 seven, uh, doing everything we can to make that possible between now and then.